students, we're going to be talking about the processing of fats or lipids for energy. So if you recall, we practice writing the structure of triacylglycerols, and uh, they are a major source of energy for most organisms. They are those hydrocarbon chains not shown in this picture, but remember they have those long hydrocarbon chains that you learned how to write on three of them on a glycerol backbone. They're highly reduced, meaning they have hydrocarbon, carbon and hydrogen, and so they can be oxidized um, they're very, have a high potential energy for oxidation and the ener energy yield per gram of fatty acid is much greater than per gram of carbohydrate. Now, what is interesting about them though, is that their structure makes it very difficult for them to freely move around the body. And so this presents a challenge for oxidation of fatty acids. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about this, and I think you will get the feeling and get, get a good understanding of why it's so difficult to burn fats for energy. So, um, all right, so this, you can look at the slide. Uh, fat is highly reduced, meaning that it's a hydrocarbon chain. It excludes water, and then um, it has a lot of potential energy that we can use, but the problem will be is how do we get it to where we need it to, to be used as an energy source. Some terminology that'll come up, uh, lipases will be important. That is the, those are the types of enzymes that will split um, the fatty acids off of the glycerol backbone. And then you have phospholipases, which catalyze the hydrolysis of bonds between the fatty acid and the rest of the phosphoacylglycerols. So uh, lipases will play a big role in our discussion. So just think of them as being able to split the bonds between the fatty acid and the glycerol backbone. Okay, so this slide is pretty important to give us kind of a feeling for what's happening. So there's a, many different sources of triacylglycerols. One is from your diet. So we're gonna talk about what happens to fats that we ingest, and then what happens to the fats that we store in adipocytes or adipose cells. Um, there's also biosynthesis of fats in the liver. We will touch upon that, but we're gonna focus mostly on diet and how we pull from fats that are stored. So one thing, so let's start, let's start with the ones that's stored because we know that those are stored in adipose cells. So let's say we need energy in the muscle that, you know, we, need, we wanna transport them to the muscle to be used as an energy source they have to be transported because they don't dissolve in water and in the bloodstream. So the protein that's involved in that transport is called serum albumin. And what's going to trigger that is um, hormone, hormonal signals. Okay, so that's a separate discussion from the fats that we eat. So the fats that we eat will come through the stomach and uh, what's gonna happen is they, they don't wanna dissolve. So the uh, gallbladder, not labeled, oh no, it's here it is. The gallbladder will release bile salts that are what are called bio, biological emulsifiers, meaning they're like a detergent. They're gonna dissolve that fat, okay? Then within, uh, the small intestine, there are some lipases that come from the pancreas that are going to start cleaving up those, um, uh, those triacylglycerols. And then they have to somehow get into the bloodstream. And when they get into the bloodstream, they're going to be packaged in a term called chylomicrons. And those are um, 
uh, lipid and protein uh, structures. Now we're gonna see this um, in a few minutes. There's a whole bunch of them. Some of them you've heard of before. Okay, so that is one issue. And then the third is that the, there's fat synthesized in the, to the liver and they can be transported through the bloodstream and be stored or go into the muscle for energy depending on uh, what's going on with our carbohydrate intake. Okay, so I know that's a lot, and so we're gonna go through it in parts. Um, I would recommend that you watch this animation. I don't know if the link is gonna work great, but you can cut and paste the link into, into uh, your browsers. And I would watch the animation because it makes this just so much better. I can't click on it for you to see it within this while, I, while I'm taping, but um, it will really help you to visualize this process. So I highly encourage you to go watch the animation and then come back and go further within the PowerPoint. Okay, so this is the part where you have the gallbladder releases these bile salts. If you look at the bile salt there, this one's cholic acid, it should look and remind you of cholesterol. And that's because cholesterol, another role of it in the body is as a precursor to these bile salts. And so uh, cholic acid, just a typical bile salt, uh, ionizes. So, you know, see the COOH, it would be really COO minus because it's ionized. And it's going to adhere to the triacylglycerol. Um, and so the cholic acid is amphipathic, meaning that it has a hydrophobic part, hydrophilic part. So the hydrophobic part's going to interact with the hydrophobic surface of the triacylglycerol, and they'll form these very sophisticated looking missile structures. Okay, the hydrophilic surf surface of the bile salt will face outward towards the water. And, um, and then what's that going to do is it's going to allow for the pancreatic lipase so remember the release of the lipase from the pancreas to digest it into much smaller missile structures that then go uh, into the uh, intestine that can then be uh, transported into the lymph system, lymphatic system for delivery throughout the body. Um, now, when it's going to do that, it's going to form um, kind of complicated looking protein lipid structures called chylomicrons. And these are the packet, the way it's packaged so that it can move through the bloodstream. So chylomicrons are essentially lipoproteins. We'll see a picture of them in a minute proteins, lipid, cholesterol, and there's a whole bunch of them that are categorized according to density. So chylomicrons is the lowest density one, and this would be for ingested fats. In the previous slide, we saw VLDL, which stands for very low density, like lipoprotein. That was the type of carrier that was used for lipids from the liver to go be stored in adipose cells or be processed for energy in the muscle. You also have uh, the more famous ones here, LDL, low density lipoproteins, and HDL. And you've heard of those with respect to cholesterol levels because those lipoproteins, a mixture of lipid and proteins, also include cholesterol. And HDL is considered our good cholesterol because later we'll see that it helps uh, return cholesterol back to the liver as opposed to being um, accumulated on the surface of the heart. 
So this is a general generalized lipoprotein structure. It has protein, it has cholesterol, it has triacylglycerols, which are here. That's that picture there. And it's all packaged in this big, well, in this big looking structure. And then it's able to move um, the triacylglycerols through the bloodstream. Okay, so here is the bloodstream with the chy chylomicron that from ingested fats eventually forms into that uh, lipoprotein structure. And then let's say now it wants to get delivered to a cell. So maybe this is an adipose cell, maybe it's a um, red blood cell, I'm sorry, a, a muscle cell. So it has to get into the cell itself and so for that, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting process. It's going to uh, attach itself to the surface of the cell. And um, what's going to happen is a, a lipase will hydrolyze the triacylglycerols that are within the chylomicron and um, free up fatty acids into the cell. If this was an adipose cell, what it would do is then repackage them into triacylglycerols again. So I know that this seems difficult, but really the idea is that fats can't move through the, through the bloodstream without help. And they're going to form these lipoprotein structures. And um, for, our, for us in metabolism, we're going to think as they move through, if you've eaten a, a very fatty, rich meal with a high fat content, then they're gonna either get, most likely will get stored. And so the chylomicron will send them over to the adipose cells. And then it has to have a process for getting into that cell, which one of the processes is highlighted here. Okay, uh, this has a lot. I just wanted you guys to get a feel for all the different pathways that go on with lipoproteins and to redistribute fat and cholesterol. What we just looked at was this path here, dietary fat and cholesterol in the intestine, use chylomicrons to take it through the bloodstream. And then um, where is it going? So let's say it's going into an adipose cell Lipases have to allow it, uh, are used to get it into the cell, and then, um, then they're resynthesized, the triacylglycerols are resynthesized for storage. Okay, um, the VLDL was the lipoprotein that takes um, fats and cholesterol from the liver to the capillary, through the blood, um, and then here, HDL was what I was telling you, is that it is the high-density lipoprotein that helps pick up cholesterol from the peripheral tissues and bring it back to the liver. So in other words, why is it considered to be the good cholesterol is that it, it's removing cholesterol out from circulation. Okay, LDL is considered the more harmful because it's not, it, it tends to accumulate more on the heart. Okay. Now, um, one thing that's shown in this picture is the following. Um, down here, it says serum albumin. Now, what's that about? If you watch that animation, I, I really like the way it looked, is that if your um, fats are now stored, and there's a signal sent that you need energy, then serum albumin is the protein. So this would be for um, stored fats. To be transferred 
to myocytes, which are muscle cells, for energy. So serum albumin is the protein, I'm sorry, lipid carrier. But it's more specific for transporting stored fats to muscle when you have a demand for energy. So you see where it says beta oxidation? We're going to talk about that. That's the processing of fats for energy. Okay, so if you look at your homework set, you'll see that I'm, I ask you questions about this process. So for us, the important part is that dietary fat gets emulsified by um, bile salts released in the gallbladder, and then lipases are, are uh, given off by the pancreas. And what that does is ultimately all of that fat will get processed into protein carriers called chylomicrons that will help deliver it to either muscle cell or adipose cell. But most of the time, if you've eaten a meal high in fat and with that has carbohydrates, those fats will get stored in adipose cells. Okay, and um, it's also interesting, it's sort of like a series of putting putting, breaking apart the fats into fatty acids and then fatty acids coming back together to form the triacylglycerols. So um, when it gets to the adipose cells, um, it will, you'll have lipoproteins there. I'm sorry, the lipoprotein is there, but it's, it's gonna cleave it. The lipases are gonna cleave it into fatty acids and then those go into the adipose tissue and then it's restored again as triacylglycerols. So, and then if you have a situation, which we'll talk about later, where you need energy from fats in the muscles, then stored fats are transferred to muscle cells for, using serum albumin, which is a lipid carrier protein. The other important piece to this is that chylomicrons are one of many different types of uh, lipoproteins, and the most famous of which are HDL and LDL. And they're, again, they're a combination of lipid, protein, cholesterol, and HDL's role is to pick up cholesterol and per peripheral tissues and take it back to the li liver for processing and and um, so that it's getting it out of circulation, whereas LDL um, is known for accumulating cholesterol on the heart and, and heart disease. And what they found over the years, it's really, it's, it's what ratio you have of LDL and HDL. Um, and so if you, you might've had your cholesterol checked at one point and they usually give you a reading of these different lipoproteins to tell you if they're within normal range or not. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, met met metabolism of fat. Okay, so um, fats have to get into the mitochondria. So we just talked about the idea that we had adipose cells that have triacylglycerols in them. And there'll be a signal that's sent that we need energy from them. Usually that signal is because you are low on glucose and you've are in a more strenuous exercise phase, let's say, and so you need fats for energy. So this is where, this is the idea that these lipases come into play and split apart the triacylglycerol to fatty acids. And then the fatty acids have to jump on serum albumin as a protein
And then these guys will end up in myocytes, muscle cells. And in muscle cells, the fatty acids have to get into the mitochondria. So remember, the, you have the outer membrane. Usually there's a, a fatty acid transporter that allows them to come through there. But then you have the mitochondria, right? And that has a double membrane layer. Okay, so the idea is this. How are these fatty acids that enter in to the muscle cells? How are they going to get into the mitochondria? I know my picture's terrible. There's a nicer one coming up. And um, so this involves a special process. The fatty acid is said to be activated. It's going to require ATP, so energy is used. So the fatty acid will react with coenzyme A. Remember coenzyme A with its sulfur group to form a fatty acid that's attached to the um, uh, coenzyme A. And one little note here, because it's important, is this actually takes a lot of energy to do this. So ATP is converted to AMP, which essentially is the equivalent of using two ATP up. So the enzyme is acyl-CoA synthetase, and now the activated fatty acid here, fatty acyl thioester, this is the activated fatty acid. That process has a very negative delta G, and now that has to get through these membranes. Okay, so this has to get into the mitochondria, but remember it's a double, it's a double membrane system. Okay, so uh, acyl-CoA will cross the outer membrane, but it has to get through the inner membrane. And how does it do this is by what's called a carnitine shuttle. And carnitine, you might have heard of um, before as a supplement, um, carnitine allows, it's, it's sort of, it's a carrier for the fatty acid essentially. And um, the enzyme that's involved is carnitine palmitoyl transferase, CPT1. Okay, and that has a specificity for fatty acid chains between 14 and 18 carbons. Okay, so here's the activated fatty acid. Here's the outer membrane of the mitochondria. It can go through there, okay? And what will happen though is for the inner membrane, it needs this special carrier. So what happens, here's carnitine. It's going to grab the activated fatty acid. And what's going to happen, you see here, coenzyme A gets regenerated. And then the uh, acyl group, the, the long hydrocarbon chain of the fatty acid gets transferred on to carnitine. So here's our fatty acid chain. That passes through the inner membrane. Okay, oh, here's the enzyme that catalyzed that reaction. That whole thing passes through the cell membrane. So it gets through to the other side and now the reverse process happens. Coenzyme A comes back in, reattaches to the fatty acid. So it's reactivated. And then carnitine is reformed. It goes back through the inner membrane to pick up another molecule. So in other words, it's picks, it picks up the fatty acid, transports it through the inner membrane, 
and then allows for the fatty acid to go back on to coenzyme A. This is a source, this is a very important uh, comment. This carnitine shuttle is a point of regulation. And there's an important molecule called melanyl-CoA that we're going to talk about later. Just remember, high amounts of melanyl-CoA will shut this process down. If the fatty acid can't get in to the mitochondria, then it cannot be processed for energy. Once it's in, it will go for energy. So and this is in the matrix of the mitochondria. There are certain genetic disorders that um, uh, interfere with the carnitine. So people have car can have carnitine deficiencies, and then that creates lifelong problems because they can't process fats for energy. And um, so that is, is uh, a genetic uh, dis disorder or disease. Uh, here's an animation you can look at for the carnitine shuttle. I'll let you look at that, and then I'll keep going. Okay, so I'm going to click to the next slide. This is beta oxidation, and when you see beta oxidation, this is the processing of fats for energy. Fatty acids. Okay, so here's our fatty acid. Remember, they have big one hydrocarbon chains. It's activated because it's on the uh, co coenzyme A. And um, so this guy here has a lot of carbons, right? Highly reduced. And so there's four steps to beta oxidation. And let me give you the highlights of those four steps. Where does it ultimately end up is it forms acetyl-CoA. So beta oxidation takes fatty acids to form acetyl-CoA. The other things that are formed is you form uh, FADH2, and if you recall, FADH2 will go into electron transport, okay? And the other thing that's formed is NADH. So if you can take a moment and write that down, that for every cycle of beta oxidation, you're going to form one FADH2, one NADH, and one acetyl-CoA. Um, now, Was that the that's the important part yeah. from this. A couple the comments. The first step that forms FADH, you see with this part here that looks scary, that's just electron transport. So all that's saying is that it immediately enters into electron transport. So you're going to form ATP. NADH goes to electron transport. OK, now where does acetyl-CoA go? That all depends. But it can go into citric acid cycle or it can form ketone bodies depending on what's going on. Okay. All right. Now, the next few steps, I'm not going to ask you questions about it. You know, I'm not going to ask specifically the names of these, but you should know, this, the part you should know is that for one cycle of beta oxidation, you make one FADH2, one NADH, and one acetyl-CoA. FADH2 and NADH go up to electron <laughs> transport, and acetyl-CoA goes either into citric acid cycle or ketone bodies. 
So this is showing just the um, first step, the reaction one, showing the, the formation of FADH2, and then that enters into uh, acetyl, I'm sorry, electron transport. Okay, so that's the first step. Step two is um, a hydration, so water is added. Step three, formation of NADH. And then step four um, is looking at the um, release of acetyl-CoA. Now here's the important part super important that this last step shortens the chain by two carbon atoms and it reactivates the end of it so here's acetyl coa coming off of this fatty acid chain and then coa goes and attaches itself to the remaining chain so this is important Okay, so let's talk about why that is, that as it goes through, the breakdown of fatty acid takes place in these steps, but it's a successive removal of two carbons at a time, and those come off as acetyl-CoA. So let's think then. You eat a fatty hamburger, and it has to go through that whole hassle of the of the digestive tract, it has to go through the hassle of going through the bloodstream on the lipoproteins. It gets stored in adipose cells. And then uh, if you are, are low on carbs and you're exercising, the signal will get sent, hey, we need it in the muscles. Then it comes over to the muscle cells. It, ha it goes through uh, has to get, goes through into the cell. Uh, but that process took serum albumin, the protein to transport it. So there's a protein involved there. Goes into the cell, has to get into the mitochondria through the carnitine shuttle. And then now it has to go through two carbons at a time to make acetyl-CoA. And hopefully what you're thinking through all that is what a hassle. So it's very rich in terms of energy that it can provide, but it's a long drawn out process. So if the body needs energy for muscle contraction, glucose is way easier to metabolize. And I hope that that's really what you get from all this is the idea that it takes a lot of effort for the body to process energy from fats. And it's so much more simple to process glucose. Glucose is water soluble. It moves through the bloodstream, comes into the cell through those glucose transporters. And then it just in the cytosol simply starts going through glycolysis and then the rest of our, what we discussed. So glucose is so much easier to process for energy. Why do we go through this though? Is if you are exercising strenuously, usually it takes somewhere around 30 to 40 minutes of strenuous exercise to start pulling from fats. And then, but then they have to go through all of this process to get their energy out of them. So it's not our go-to for energy glucose is. But once it is used for energy, you can get a lot of energy from it. Okay, I already said this part. Okay, I wanna go through this calculation just to give you a feel for it. This would be for an uh, 18 carbon fatty acid which is our friend stearic acid. Remember that from your writing of fats. Okay, so um, let's talk about how this would work and um, so that you understand some of these numbers that are being shown. 
So I'm going to draw it here. Okay, so that should be 18. Okay, and maybe I'll write it like this. Well, okay, bear with me. Okay, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Then the only thing I want to do is erase these last two and put them in a different color. Okay, I don't need to put all the hydrogens in there, right? Okay, so what I want you to notice is we have uh, 18 carbons. It's gonna go through our beta oxidation process and it's gonna give off one NADH, or I guess we'll start with FADH too, just to be consistent. and then an NADH. And then notice what's gonna happen is this is gonna be cleaved off. And so you're gonna end up with acetyl-CoA. Now, I'm going to get really fancy here. Okay, now what's going to happen is part of that process of beta oxidation, acetyl-CoA, not acetyl-CoA, just CoA, sorry. Mm. So just plain old CoA is going to come in and attach here. That's the last step, right? Of beta oxidation. Okay, so now what's that going to do is um, I'm going to draw it with the purple to be consistent. Okay, so two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, and now they should be 16. Okay, you see that? So we should have two less, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, right? We started off with 18 carbon fatty acid. And now we're at 16 carbon fatty acid. It's going to churn through another cycle. of beta oxidation. And we're gonna get acetyl-CoA off of the end of it. And then the rest of the fatty acid. 
Now let's talk about how many times this is going to happen. Depends on the length of the chain, right? So I'm gonna pick a different color. So that's one round of beta oxidation, two rounds, three rounds, four rounds, five rounds, six rounds, seven rounds, eight rounds of beta oxidation. Okay, so it goes through eight rounds of beta oxidation. So eight rounds would be eight FADH2, eight NADH, and eight acetyl CoA's. However, however, um, there's going to be this one here on the end, right? So let's count the acetyl CoA's. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But there's going to be an acetyl CoA at the very end, nine. So it's eight acetyl CoA plus one acetyl CoA. But that guy didn't go through beta oxidation. It's the leftover two carbons at the end. Okay, now where does FADH2 and NADH go? These guys go to electron transport chain. And our nine acetyl CoA's, these guys go to citric acid cycle. So now if we want to do some math, which we do, skipping here because this is good. So see where it says eight rounds of beta oxidation, eight FADH2 are formed, eight NADH are formed. There were nine acetyl CoA's formed. Okay, so this we did on the previous slide, or the, the slide that was uh, that I wrote it out. Okay, now here's our conversion factors to ATP. One and a half ATP for every one FADH2, two and a half ATP for every one NADH. So from eight rounds of beta oxidation, you get 12 ATPs from FADH2 and 20 ATPs from NADH. But we're not done. The nine acetyl CoA's go into CREB or citric acid cycle. Do you recall that citric acid cycle has three NADH for every churn around the cycle, one FADH2 and one GTP that's essentially an ATP. So if it's going through nine times Krebs, then it'd be nine times three NADH. That's 27 NADH times two and a half for the conversion factor is 67.5 ATPs. Nine FADH2 times one and a half is 13.5 and nine GTP is nine ATP. So that's already ATP. Okay, you add that all up here, that's 122 ATP. And we're like, wow, that's a lot of ATP for a fat. That's why we think of them as being very high in energy because they have so much carbon in them to oxidize. And then um, this minus two, do you remember for carnitine shuttle, Oh, sorry, no, no, for fatty acid uh, activation. Sorry, sorry. So to activate the fatty acid, remember I, I said to you, hey, uh, it goes ATP to all the way to AMP. That was like using up to ATP. So energy-wise, so that's why we subtract it off. So that's 120 ATP for a very standard 18 carbon fatty acid chain. 
That's in comparison to the glucose, which we did on the previous PowerPoint. Okay, very uh, much a lot higher amount of ATP. It's just that they're so hard to process because it takes a lot of processes to metabolize them if we've eaten them. And then it takes um, a depletion of glucose for the signal to get sent to release them from adipose cells. And then they have to go on that special protein carrier, serum albumin, to the muscle cells for energy. So it's, it's, a, it's a process that's slow. Okay, so ketone bodies is another fate of acetyl-CoA. So there are situations where instead of going into Krebs cycle, acetyl-CoA forms what are called ketone bodies. This would be in situations where you have a high intake of fats and are low in carbohydrates, uh, diabetes that's not controlled, and starvation. Ketone bodies are a weird name. They are simply uh, these three molecules called acetone, beta-hydroxybutyrate, and acetoacetate. They can be used as a fuel in place of glucose in most tissues, uh, except for, well, let's talk a little bit about that next, next statement, because acetone's usually um, uh, excreted either in urine or through our breath, and it kind of creates a fruity breath, which used to be, is a signal or sign of diabetes. So it's usually this beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate that are used as the fuels. Okay. Um, if an organism has an excessive amount of acetyl CoA, it'll produce ketone bodies. So when will this happen? Is when you have um, high amounts of acetyl CoA. And, but they're not being processed in Krebs cycle. Okay, important point. Let me erase what I just wrote. It's taken up what I wanted to write in here. Okay, let's think back to one of the big things that I told you to, or asked you to remember, which is our friend, Oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate was that molecule that picks up acetyl-CoA to start churning around Krebs or citric acid cycle. Can I call it Krebs? Okay. So, oh, I should, I was calling it citric acid. When, when I was in school, we just always called it Krebs and then it kind of fell out of favor. So, okay, citric acid. Okay. Do you recall me making a big deal? And if you don't remember, go back in your notes. The big deal I made was that oxaloacetate can be diverted for gluconeogenesis. To make glucose. Do you recall that I said that if it does this, if it's diverted that way, you shut down citric acid cycle. Okay, so in diabetes, okay, so in diabetes, um, Glucose has trouble getting into cells. It's, uh, we're, and we're gonna look more at this a little later, just be just a little intro right now. It's either because the hormone insulin, which we haven't talked too much about yet, 
Um, insulin is, you don't produce enough of it. So the signal doesn't, that's the hormone signal that lets glucose into the cell. Or you have a problem with those glu uh, glucose transporters. Either, either route, uh, either your body doesn't produce enough insulin, that's uh, type 1 diabetes, or you have a problem with the receptor, Fluke 4. Either way, glucose does not get into your cells. So you have high blood sugar. But your cells don't know that. Your cells think you do not have enough sugar. So what goes on in the cell is you start kicking in gluconeogenesis. What does that do? Diverts oxaloacetate to gluconeogenesis to make glucose. And then that shuts down Krebs. When you shut down Krebs cycle, Acetyl-CoA starts increasing in amounts. And instead of churning around on citric acid, it goes and makes ketone bodies. Excessive ketone bodies, well, let's look at their structures here. I know such a weird name, right? The acetones gets excreted out in urine, we breathe it out, get rid of it through breath, so acetone. Yeah, the acetone that's used as nail polish remover. Okay, not great for us, right? But that gets eliminated out. But the beta-hydroxybutyrate and the, um, where's the other one here? Oh, acetoacetate. They're both carboxylic acids. So ketone bodies are carboxylic acids. And remember what we learned about them, their pKa is low. So they ionize. So they are acidic. And in, if you have uncontrolled diabetes, then you have these ketone bodies that are acidic and that makes your bloodstream more acidic, and then it's known as ketoacidosis. It can be very dangerous because remember, our blood body bloodstream's buffered, but it can only take so much before that buffer gets ruined. And so in, in an extreme diabetic uh, ketoacidosis, you can go into a coma and die because your bloodstream's too acidic. In starvation mode, so you haven't eaten for six hours, as starvation gets prolonged. So uh, starvation we're going to talk about because it's it's sort of like after six hours, four to, between four and six hours, depending on your glucose levels. But let's say you're at six, hour six, you haven't eaten. You go into starvation mode. What's going to happen is that the body's going to pull again gluconeogenesis, you're up here, gluconeogenesis, oxaloacetate gets diverted, citric acid uh, shuts down, and again, you're gonna have high amounts of acetyl-CoA, and you'll have ketone bodies. These guys will go uh, to the brain Acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate will go to the brain as an alternative fuel. So that's the idea of ketosis. Now, if we hadn't had such a short semester, we could talk a lot more about that, but hopefully on uh, in, in next Tuesday, a week, a week from tomorrow, Zoom, we can talk more about the idea of ketosis. Um, but that, that is um, the outcome of not having carbohydrates anymore is you're going to have fats pulled for energy 
But if the body is trying to preserve the brain and do gluconeogenesis, then um, Krebs is shut down. So you're going to make ketone bodies as an alternative fuel for the brain. Okay, so this has um, a lot of different information, exactly what I just said. Uh, ketogenesis occurs primarily in the liver, so the formation of ketone bodies is a liver thing. Um, here, during fasting or starvation, oxaloacetate, that's oxaloacetate levels fall, limiting citric acid cycle. Um, Acetyl-CoA is then converted to acetyl, I'm sorry, ketone bodies, which are these three acids. Um, and so the formation of ketone bodies is called ketogenesis. It occurs primarily in the liver. And then um, ketone bodies are then transported for, to other tissues, primarily the brain, uh, as an alternative fuel. Uh, it's also will form ketoacidosis if it's extreme. And um, that's because they're acids, they're carboxylic acids. So you see here, they've been deprotonated, which then leads to a decrease in pH in the blood. Okay, and I already went through this. Um, you can read it, but I said this already. Some loose ends, and these are more just an FYI for odd number of fatty acids. Um, they're not encountered super frequently, but they also undergo beta oxidation um, and they end up forming uh, one molecule of propanyl CoA. This isn't important. I just, for, I'm not going to ask you on this, but just so you know that there's these other side paths for different, to accommodate differences in fatty acids. Unsaturated fats still go through beta oxidation, but they're, they have an additional two reactions that have to be in place there to complete the process. So they still go through beta oxidation, but just um, in a slightly modified beta oxidation pathway. Okay, one last path to talk about is biosynthesis of fatty acids, how we um, uh, take um, acetyl-CoA and form fats. Uh, I just want to point some one thing out. Uh, first of all, it's not the reversal of beta oxidation. It's pretty complex. Um, but there, just one step of it is all I really want you to think about is the first step of going towards making uh, fatty acid synthesis is to convert acetyl-CoA to a molecule called malonyl-CoA. And the important part about malonyl-CoA is that, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll regulate the carnitine shuttle. And what does that mean then? Is that if you have a, a lot of acetyl-CoA and you're gonna go store it as fats, so this is our fat-making branch that we don't like, then as you see an increase in malonyl CoA, you're going to shut off fatty acid oxidation. So just like everything we've talked about, if one pathway is activated, another one closes. Okay, so that is an issue. When will this happen is when you have high amounts of glucose, high amounts of fats, then you're going to make too much acetyl-CoA and it's going to start on the pathway to making fats for storage. This is why people get overweight. So I won't go into all this. It's essentially what you see is it's a lengthy process to build from acetyl-CoA to a, a long fatty acid chain. This one's showing it palmitate. Um, I'm skipping those because I'm I don't ask anything anything except for the whole malonyl CoA. Um, 
The regulation of fat metabolism, the rate limiting step is the carnitine shuttle. And so if you have high amounts of malonyl CoA, that's shut down. You shut down beta oxidation. The other thing that shuts down fat metabolism is high amounts of NADH. So if you think about it, that makes sense because that's a product of beta oxidation. So if you have a high amount of NADH, excess amounts, because you're not running them through electron transport chain, then it's also going to uh, shut down beta oxidation. Okay, uh, this last slide is to just show you how important acetyl-CoA is. It is the hub of metabolism. If you have carbohydrates present, then carbohydrates are our go-to for energy. Water-soluble, found in the muscles, is glycogen. You're going to use those for energy. The brain loves them for energy to fire those neurons. If you have a depletion of carbohydrates, then acetyl-CoA will um, break down and come in to citric acid cycle for energy, ATP. If in the case of starvation where you need glucose, then the citric acid cycle shut down and gluconeogenesis not shown is promoted in the liver and acetyl-CoA forms ketone bodies. If you have um, a no normal amounts of glucose and you, that's running Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, and you have too much sugar and too much fat that you've ingested then what will happen is acetyl-CoA will do what we don't like and make fats. And that branch is going to be when you have glucose plus low activity. Oops, I can't spell activity. And citric acid uh, cycle if you have too much glucose, too much fats, but you're not use, burning it up for energy, then this big red arrow is going to store those guys as fats. So acetyl-CoA, really important for you guys to know all its possible fates.